Welcome to Garner's Greek Mythology. This is Patrick Garner. I'm a mythologist and the author of three novels. They constitute a trilogy and have one theme. That is, that the ancient Greek gods are here now and that they never left. Join me as we walk with them on a unique journey. What has been lost in the modern interpretation of so-called mythology will come to life again. Like my books, Garner's Greek Mythology Podcast looks at the ancient gods assuming they are alive among us. For just a moment, I want you to suspend your disbelief. Welcome to episode four of Garner's Greek Mythology. I'm your host, mythologist and author Patrick Garner. In our last episode, we pulled the curtain off the long-forgotten goddess Gaia, taking you way back in time. In fact, to a time that predates everything, to a time when there wasn't time. As we measure years, Earth began about four to four and a half billion years ago. That was then. Today, we pivot to an era far closer to our own. And as always, this series focuses on one thing, Greek gods, of course. Here, the ancient gods are not considered imaginary, hardly. Let's start with a story. In the early years in Greece, when people lived in small, scattered kingdoms, there was a king who desperately wanted a son. The king's name was Acrisios. His wife, Eurydice, was the daughter of the king of Sparta. Their blood was royal and their wealth immense. Their only child was a daughter named Dany. The king consulted a famous oracle, asking whether he would ever have a son. The oracle's reply was alarming. You, great king, will see no son, but your daughter, Dany, will give birth to a boy who will grow up to kill you. At this dreadful news, the king, intent upon shielding Dany from contact with any man, encased her when she reached puberty within an underground bronze chamber. The chamber had a single aperture for sun and light, but the opening was too small for anyone, child or man, to crawl through. What the king had not foreseen was that a mighty god had glimpsed Dany moments before she was imprisoned. One look was enough to fill the god with desire. Within days of Dany being closed in this impenetrable chamber, the god came to her in the form of a shower of small gold coins as she slept. The shower poured into her lap, and in her dream, she cried out in rapture. In due course, she gave birth to a son and named him Perseus. The king despaired, and in a fit of self-preservation, sealed Dany and her son in a wooden chest and had them cast into the ocean to drown. What the king had not anticipated was that the god who had come to Dany now protected mother and baby and had the chest drift gently into the beaches of a distant island. There Perseus was raised to manhood, unaware of the prophecy and unaware of his grandfather's name. Fulfilling the prophecy, Perseus killed his grandfather, never knowing they were related. And the mighty god who had come to Dany in a golden shower the great god Zeus, the mightiest of the Olympians. You see, King Acrios had never had a chance. Even today, we know the name Zeus. He appears in books and cartoons and Hollywood extravaganzas, and he's become amazingly one-dimensional. To know Zeus, we have to pursue the stories of others. The mighty Zeus becomes far more real through the lives of those he touched. In this episode, we're going to focus on Hercules. We meet a beautiful woman named Io. 
the massive giants, the first woman, Pandora. But what is Zeus most famous for today? Sadly, throwing thunderbolts. That's what we all think of. But at the peak of his glory millennium ago, he was infamous for something else. And that something else was pursuing women. The story I just told of Dany is only a hint at his activities. His line of work, his vocation could, in a nutshell, be represented as a single consuming passion. Any female who caught his eye would, in short order, be Zeus's. In addition to countless conquests, Zeus had seven wives, two his sisters, and a marriage hardly checked his roving eye. Hera, one of his sisters, an Olympic god and his last wife, was extremely begrudging of his dalliances, not of his ridiculous thunderbolts, but of his constant conquests. She seethed at his affairs, and she tried to thwart his escapades, usually to no avail. And so today's protagonist is Zeus, whom the Romans renamed Jupiter. Zeus's Germanic equivalent was a god named Thor, who also specialized in lightning and storms. In reality, Thor was probably lifted by the Germanic tribes from the more sophisticated Greeks. No one at the time had qualms about such thefts. Inexplicably, in the English-speaking world, Thor, unlike Zeus, had a day name for him, Thor's Day, which we call Thursday. But whether masquerading as Zeus, Jupiter, or Thor, this god was feared as an unapologetic bully. He ruled by might, particularly in his early years. No one dared argue with him, and he took what he wanted. Zeus was a womanizer, a seducer, and frankly, a wolf. His Roman and German twins were poor imitations, mere phantoms in comparison. You see, Zeus always got the girl. Our last episode was about Gaia, the greatest goddess of all time. And I noted then that neither Gaia nor Zeus could appear before humans in their natural state. She burned brighter than any. And Zeus was the god of lightning. As it was known to be with Gaia, any human who saw Zeus as Zeus would be incinerated. Instead, he appeared before humans, before Greeks, as a bull or a swan, a, a snake, a cuckoo or an eagle, a flame of fire or as a mere shepherd. And remember his appearance before Dany. He arrived in her underground chamber as a shower of gold coins. How romantic. But then it was night, and she was fast asleep. I suppose you could say she never knew what hit her. But today's courts would call his escapade rape. Still, these disguises served Zeus's purposes. First, almost all who encountered him survived the encounter. Second, no woman he stalked fled in fear. Of course not. They had no idea who he was. And last, disguised, he could easily evade his wife, Hera, whose jealousy was almost always justified. As time went by, Zeus became less violent, less the seducer and more the mediator. In the Odyssey, Homer depicts Zeus as a moderating force, more the reasonable god than the goat. Like his daughter Athena, he was depicted as exercising wisdom and justice. As the entire pantheon of Greek gods aged, Zeus, the rapist, became a protector of law. I find it fascinating that the Greeks saw him simultaneously as a consummate seducer and as the arbitrator and judge of all that was good and fair. No one, of course, bothered to ask his last wife, Hera, her opinion. Yet, in the later years of the Greek Empire, Zeus's attributes were extended further. He was portrayed as a defender of the household and guardian of the hearth and even hospitality. He became champion of friendships and ensured oaths. It was, after all, rather bizarre given that he was a serial adulterer whose children were countless. Yet the Greeks made no attempt to paper over these contradictions. And get this, 
Because he told so many lies to Hera, he was said to pardon lies told by mortals in the name of love. Shakespeare's Juliet declares, At lovers' perjuries, they say, Zeus laughs. I noted earlier that two of his wives were also his sisters. Incest was not common among the ancient Greeks, but no one blinked if the incest was between gods. Demeter was the first of Zeus's sisters to become his wife. After their union, she bore Zeus a daughter, Persephone. And Persephone, in turn, was abducted by Zeus's brother, Hades, and dragged into the underworld to become his wife. Demeter, brokenhearted, Demeter, remember, is Persephone's mother, is told that Zeus approves. But Demeter wanders for a year in mourning before learning the truth. In her grief, she makes the whole world barren. A great famine ensues. Zeus begins to fear that the famine will wipe out all humans, that no one will be left to offer sacrifices to the gods. He finally sends the god Hermes to drag Persephone home from Hades. Of course, complications arise. In the end, Persephone must agree to return to Hades for four months a year. You can probably see the symbolism in this. The four months represented the Greek winter. And in this tale, Zeus assumes the mantle of Grand Conciliator. Oddly to us, he negotiates between his brother, Hades, his sister and wife, Demeter, and his own daughter, Persephone. As you can see in Olympus, it's all dreadfully entangled. Other Zeus stories? Uh, Let's discuss Athena's birth. If you're seeped in Greek mythology, you may remember that she was born fully armored, sword in hand. She was known as Zeus's favorite daughter, and for good reason. Her mother was Metis, that's M-E-T-I-S, which in Greek means intelligence. Metis, by the way, was Zeus's first wife. When she was pregnant, Zeus learned that her second child would be a male who was destined to overthrow him, as Zeus had overthrown his own father. This son-kills-father threat was a common threat in Greek tales. So to protect himself from Metis' second child yet unborn, Zeus swallowed her whole. Think about that for a moment, his wife for lunch. When the time came for the first child to be born, Hephaestus, one of the Olympic gods, struck Zeus's forehead with an axe and Athena sprung out, shouting her war cry across the heavens. And so in a bizarre birth that leaves us incredulous, Athena, the protector of Athens, came into being in a moment worthy of Hollywood. And Zeus was none the worse for having been struck between the eyes with an axe. The stories go on. There's a famous one about a man named Sisyphus who was condemned upon his death to forever roll a stone up a hill, only to have it rolled down again just as he nears the top. We call this impossible labor a Sisyphean task. But of course, Zeus is the cause. Zeus's dalliance with yet another young woman that brings it all to a head. Sisyphus, you see, was the king of Corinth, a major Greek city to the south of Athens. Zeus, always on the prowl, had carried off a river god's daughter. Sisyphus saw the abduction and told the girl's father what he'd seen. Furious, the river god pursued Zeus, trying to retrieve her, but Zeus beat him back with thunderbolts. Of course, in due time, the girl bore Zeus a son. But even in his pride, Zeus sought revenge upon the indiscreet Sisyphus. After all, the king was a mere mortal, and Zeus would use him as an example, a warning to others. At this juncture, the story becomes even more convoluted. The war god Ares is tasked with carrying Sisyphus to the underworld, yet the king escapes. When he's finally captured and turned over to Hades, his punishment is to perpetually roll this stone up a hill over and over for eternity. 
So once again, Zeus gets the girl, and anyone trying to stop him gets the boot. Of course, it couldn't be any other way. So we can conclude that Zeus was a bully and a rogue. But where did he come from? In the last episode, I introduced Gaia. Remember, she conjured the earth on a whim. Then she granted the sky life and called it Uranus. Instantly, it became a him, the first male. Then from Gaia and Uranus's union, she bore children that the Greeks called Titanicos, whom we call the Titans. The Titans became the parents of the initial Olympic gods. So Zeus was the firstborn of the Titans, followed by Hades and Poseidon, and then their sisters Demeter, Hera, and Hestia. Divine offspring from Zeus's later affairs included Aphrodite, Ares, Apollo, Artemis, Athena, Hephaestos, and Hermes. And therefore Gaia, the greatest of all goddesses, was Zeus's grandmother. Now the story of Prometheus, who was one of the titans at Titanicos. He's famous for having stolen fire from heaven and giving it to man, and famous for his subsequent punishment. Prometheus is frequently featured in works of literature, theater, and philosophy. His fate is a particularly tragic one and serves as an example of Zeus's cruelty when crossed. The Greeks always viewed Prometheus as a champion and, and a benefactor. Zeus, on the other hand, was infuriated at his theft, Prometheus's duplicity. The story is riddled with secondary intrigues. One of them is the story of Pandora, who is somewhat equivalent to the biblical Eve. You've heard of Pandora's box. Yes, this is the same girl, Zeus order her to be created as a punishment to mankind for their thanks to Prometheus for his gift of fire. But I think it's a tribute to the power of women that they've been reliably feared by men throughout time. They're consistently maligned, and it's not because they're inferior. In fact, it's the opposite. Pandora in this story is created as a plague to torment men. She is, in effect, the first woman. You'll see the similarity in a moment to the Adam and Eve story. Pandora, by the way, means in Greek, all gifts, which was intended to be richly ironic as her gifts included sorrows and disease. So it goes down like this. Zeus orders Athena and Aphrodite to shower Pandora with grace and beauty. Hermes awards her cunning and deceit. Yet, once she is suitably beautiful, Zeus sends her to Prometheus's brother, who, of course, can't resist her and takes her as his bride. His brother was warned by Prometheus to never accept a gift from Zeus, yet he forgets the warning upon seeing Pandora. She's the classic femme fatale, the enchantress who waylays every man. Of course, since this little bit of theater is written and directed by Zeus, nothing good comes of it, certainly not for mankind. You see, as part of her dowry, Pandora brings a pithos, a great jar which has been filled by Zeus with sorrow, disease, and endless labor. So you can guess where this is heading. When she opens the jar, what we commonly call Pandora's box, all of these ills pour out, oozing across the earth. Imagine bats and snakes and three-headed lizards leaping from the pithos. Talk about revenge. But Zeus was far from being finished. Prometheus was a titan, and Pandora's unfortunate gifts affected mankind, not one of the titanicos. So Zeus punished Prometheus by having him chained to a cliff on a distant mountain. That fate paled by what came next. Zeus sent a massive eagle to tear at his liver. Every day the eagle reappeared and preyed on him, and every night the damage was repaired 
so that his suffering might occur another day. This went on endlessly. After ages had passed, Zeus relented and allowed his son Hercules, pronounced by the Greeks Heracles, to shoot the eagle, thus finally freeing Prometheus from his torment. In a previous episode, I mentioned the battle between Gaia's children and her great-grandchildren. Zeus was one of those grandchildren, of course. The Greeks called this battle the Gigantomachia, the Battle of Giants. The giants were the bizarre children of Gaia who had also birthed the Titans. Heracles played a key role in this event as well, attacking them with a storm of arrows. Zeus, of course, instigated the attack, wielding endless thunderbolts. Dionysus played his wingman, striking the giants with his staff. The Battle of the Giants was a key moment in the Greek mythos. The Olympic gods were victors, and the defeat of the giants allowed the gods to reign uncontested. The key warrior, the leader in this rebellion, was Zeus with his quiver of lightning bolts. And following this confrontation, the pantheon of gods reigned unchallenged throughout the Greek world. Any retelling of Zeus's countless stories must include the sad and, and really rather strange tale of Io, who while wandering the earth encounters Prometheus still chained to a cliff. Io was a, a virgin priestess in the temple of Hera. Hera, you'll recall, was Zeus's last wife. Here again we have a story of desire and how Zeus's amorous pursuits destroyed lives and caused endless suffering. For Io was a remarkable beauty. She unknowingly caught Zeus's attention. And he began to send her seductive dreams. Remember, she was a temple priestess. Night after night, the dreams became more intense, directing her to come lie with him in some secret meadow. She always woke bewildered and finally confessed her dreams to her father. He consulted the Delphic Pythia, asking the oracle for guidance. Shockingly, the Pythia tells her father that Io must be driven from his country, that otherwise his whole race will be decimated by lightning storms. Let's pause a moment. Who could possibly cause lightning storms? So it's inevitable. Father and daughter part tearfully. Hera, though, is outraged. Not only has she lost a key priestess, Hera concludes that Zeus is the cause. And here's where the story becomes really strange. Hera, in her jealous fury, turns Io, the beautiful Io, into a cow. It's always struck me as absurd. Worse, convinced that Zeus will still want Io even in this transformed state. After all, Zeus has been known to appear before humans as a bull. Hera besieges Io with stinging flies so that she can't rest long enough for Zeus to have his way. The flies drive her throughout the world. It's during these travels that she runs across Prometheus, himself a victim of the utterly cruel Zeus. His only words of wisdom to Io are that she still has far to travel. And so after years of doing so, she eventually reaches Egypt where, miraculously, she escapes the flies. Io, too, regains her human form. Zeus finds her. She has the inevitable son. Io is eventually redeemed. The Egyptians worship her as Zeus's consort. Some stories say that she becomes the goddess Isis and her son worshipped as the bull god Apis. And Zeus, 
Does Io's torment cause him any grief? Is there some just punishment that comes his way? Of course not. He's the thunder god and lives another day. Heracles. I've mentioned his name a couple of times. The Romans, like, like we do, called him Hercules, but to the Greeks, he was Heracles. He was Zeus's son, not the only one, but definitely his favorite. His mother's name was Alchemy, and she was married to a local king. There were many backstories that involved Alchemy, but the most significant one occurred one lonely night. While her king was away, Zeus visited masquerading as her man, pretending, of course, to have finally come home from the endless battles. She spent a joyful night with him, and before the sun rose, she was pregnant with a new son, the child who was to become the famous Heracles. The king, of course, returned shortly after and was sure the child was his. I'll skip the minor details of Heracles' childhood. Suffice to say that Zeus hovered in the background ensuring that his son received proper training in music, philosophy, wrestling, swordplay, and bow shooting. The gods favored him. Hermes gifted him a magnificent sword. Hephaestus crafted a golden breastplate, and Athena sent him a robe. He was, after all, Zeus's son. Heracles' stories were legion in Greece. After the gods, he was easily the most legendary figure in their complicated mythos. Yet Heracles was also a deeply tragic figure. Although the strongest human alive, he was constantly atoning for grievous errors, blunders he'd made, and dreadful mistakes. For instance, he married and had children, but his happiness was short-lived. Hera, it seems to be always Hera, jealous of Zeus's progeny, sent him into a temporary homicidal fit. In his madness, he murdered his wife and children, then recovered his sanity. Shocked at his actions, he self-exiled, then subjected himself to endless ritual purification. Finally, still in grief, he consulted the Delphic Pythia, she told him that he would never be purified unless he performed 12 labors. These are the famous 12 labors of Heracles. He did so, spending years overcoming seemingly impossible challenges. In the end, he redeemed himself, gaining legendary status throughout Greece. Like Zeus, Heracles was the lover of countless women and fathered numerous children. He married again and again had children. Yet, in a great irony, the strongest man alive was killed by his new wife. And the killing was for love, not revenge for some imagined slight. She had been given a potion that she was told would bind Heracles to her forever. He would, he would never love another woman. Of course, the prophecy was accurate because the potion was a deadly toxin. Instead of killing him instantly, though, the potion caused him extraordinary suffering. Finally, to escape his pain, he built an immense bonfire and threw himself upon it. And so, amidst his numberless accomplishments, his life was one of great tragedy. And his father, Zeus, did he ever try to save his favorite son? No, not, not really. Zeus's kindest gesture followed Heracles' death. Zeus made him immortal and granted him access to Olympia, but that gift was given only after a lifetime of tests and endless trauma. Because this episode is about Zeus, we can conclude from the saga of Heracles that Zeus's powers were finite, or, or at least miserly. 
I think Zeus's failings can be attributed to his self-obsession, his conceit. He constantly set events in the motion while thoughtlessly moving on to new pursuits. What happened to his creations didn't matter. Zeus had moved on. Think of poor Io, driven from country to country by stinging flies. Did he make any attempt to save her? He could have, but he didn't. Or Pandora, the first woman. Zeus created her solely to bring grief to mankind. She was a pawn. Revenge trumped all. And there's Demeter, his own sister and wife, who conceived Persephone. Did Zeus fawn over his new daughter? Hardly. He approved when his brother Hades decided to take Persephone as his wife, and his indifference condemned Demeter to a full year of despair while she searched aimlessly across the world for Persephone. Zeus never consulted Demeter. Why would he? It never occurred to him. All the while, his daughter was held against her wishes by the dark god of death, Hades. So Zeus's actions are, without exception, those of an egotistical and utterly self-absorbed god. What are we to make of him? Is there some modern lesson we can take away from this train of woes and tribulation? In the many stories of Zeus, there are few bright moments. He was a divine pirate who took what he wished. The events he set in motion rarely ended well. Those he touched frequently found misfortune and calamity. Scholars are silent about what actually happened to Zeus. We know he disappeared. We know that his whereabouts became unknown. But I imagined in my final book, Homo Divinitus, how this took place, what happened to him. And I concluded that in the end, at Zeus's end, the mishap was his. Sometime, I imagine, in the current era, probably around 8 to 900 AD, Gaia, the greatest of all goddesses, commanded his presence. The two met in Greece at a small shepherd's retreat on the plains of Marathon. It was a humble location. I imagine that Gaia chose it purposely. It would be appropriate that Zeus appeared at this hideaway as a mortal, and Gaia would have come in her usual guise as a nine-year-old girl. They would have been such an unlikely pair, but there would have been no humans within miles. The Olympic gods at this point had long fallen out of favor and Christianity ruled the entire region, and the new religion was totally unforgiving of any other belief. Zeus himself would have seen each of his temples destroyed systematically. No one sacrificed to him. No one sacrificed to any of the old gods. And his ability to seduce any girl he saw had disappeared in the same way that the smoke from sacrifices had vanished. He would have been a shadow of himself. When Gaia told him on that day that he was to make something of himself, that his freeloading in Olympia was done, he raised a thunderbolt in fury. Doing so was a terrible mistake as Gaia simply raised a finger. He never questioned his superiority over women, but with a whisper, <laughs> Gaia stripped him of his remaining powers. He'd come to the meeting disguised as a mortal and left the small retreat as a mortal. The Zeus of old, the self-serving titan killer, was gone. Gaia blinded him as a punishment for his defiance. Then she sent him out in rags with a walking stick to wander. Within a week, a pack of wild dogs smelled him downwind. Although he couldn't see them coming, he could hear their frenzied baying as they closed on him. Gaia watched it all. As always, she was clinical, simply observing the carnage.
and it was all over within minutes. Zeus was the first and the greatest of the Olympic gods. He also became the first to be lost in the changing tides. Ares would be the next, but his death would not come from crossing Gaia. But we'll get to his story in a future episode. In the meantime, in our next podcast, we'll discuss Athena, or as the Greeks called her, Athene. Like so many of the Olympic gods, she too was a child of Zeus and a fierce protector of Athens. Join me for the next episode of Garner's Greek Mythology. This is your host, Patrick Garner. Be sure to visit patrickgarnerbooks.com or find me on Amazon. My three novels are set in today's world and feature Greek gods who meddle and maneuver as they always have. Special musical thanks to my talented nephew, Mark Garner, with Saraz Handpans, who has graciously gifted us with several of the background pieces in this episode. <laughs>